Open your Bibles to the Ephesian letter, and we'll begin there. We have had some of the finest lessons doctrinally and qualitatively. It's been my privilege to hear some of those whom I have tried to invest my life in. I think that what you've heard this week are the kinds of lessons that the Brotherhood worldwide, according to the feeling of the pulse I'm getting over the past number of years, desperately needs in order to maintain the truth of the gospel and save the souls of men worldwide. I just hope I can measure up to the quality of the lessons that have been preached already this week. As we look at the Ephesian letter, if you read it, you'll not find a statement of purpose anywhere in the letter. One of the challenges of the student of Ephesians is to determine why Paul wrote the letter. Now you read the other letter that was companion to that one, Colossians, and boy, there's a statement of purpose just leaps off the page, such as it is in the book of Galatians and some other passages, other, other epistles. But you'll come to the book of Ephesians and you'll search in vain to have a statement of purpose as to why he said what he did. Now, why then did the apostle say some of the very things that he said? For an illustration, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, look at verses 4 through 6, which is the assignment that we're preaching on this week. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion. That's the way that should have been translated. One God and Father of all, over all, through all, and in all. Why did Paul say that? What is the reason for which he told these people what they should have known to become Christians in the first place? Why is he saying it? Why does he say anything that he says in the letter? And this letter has been held up by any number of students through the centuries as being the very top most work of the Apostle Paul even going beyond the great message of Galatians and Romans. In the Christology, he, he excels in showing the Christology of Christ is far above any other name that has ever been named or will be named. Now to help us get the answer to that, let's go to, a, to the passage that was just read. Oh, I hope you listened to that. In chapter 19, we find that the children of God, who've been listening to Paul for the past three years of his preaching ministry, then at the end of this ministry, these members of the Church of Christ have reverted back to their old pagan belief system and practices. Now, involved in some of these practices, well, let me start off with this by saying that Ephesians was a haven for magicians. It was a place that welcomed the practice of the black arts. And it affected the body of Christ dynamically. To the extent that it states in verse 11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now why did he work these miracles, these special outstanding miracles? In order to get the attention of the city. And he did that, if you've listened to that and how he accomplished that. And it stated that fear came upon the whole city and the name of Jesus was magnified. But that wasn't the major issue here. In verse 18, it says, Many of them that believed brought their books. Uh, uh, many of them that believed... Uh, I'm sorry. Let me read that passage here. My mind is ahead of my mouth. Here in verse 18, Many also of them that believed came confessing and declaring their deeds. Now, after Paul had exposed the sham of these strolling Jews who were exorcists. They thought they could cast out demons. But when they found Paul casting out demons in the name of Christ, they just, uh, they couldn't cast out demons. If they could, they wouldn't have said, they wouldn't have taken upon them to name over them that had the evil spirits, the name of Jesus, saying, I jure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth. If they could have cast out demons, they wouldn't have tried a new magical incantation. These people were believers in magical incantations. And that's what was uh, 
these strolling Jews actually interpreted what Paul was doing. He found a special selection of words, naming the names that would work on casting out these demons. That's the way they, they looked at it. And so you know the story of how that the evil spirit that was upon the, the man leaped upon them and prevailed against them, and they ran out of that house naked and wounded. And the whole city saw it and found out that what Paul was doing was effective, and what they were doing was nothing in the world but hypocrisy. And so it affected the entire city. It got their attention. But the greatest effect here is in verse 18, where he says, Many of them that believed came confessing and declaring their deeds, and not a few of them that practiced magical arts. Talking about Christians. Brought their books together and burned them to the tune of 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of books on magical arts. Now, you can go to your computer and you can bring up under the heading of magical papyri some of the very incantations that were being used while Paul was at Ephesus. In his book, Ephesians, Power and Magic, Clinton Arnold brings out one of those incantations, which was called the Aphasia Grammata. The Aphasia Grammata had another name. It was called Naming the Names, because there were six names here, one of which was Adonai. And these six names, now they had to be pronounced in proper order, or it wouldn't work, you understand. And then they had to say it in the right sequence. The first name came first, and the second name came second. But if they did that correctly, then this would obligate the gods and the goddesses to come and rescue them from the evil spirits that were controlling their lives. That was their viewpoint. They had a terrible view, a horrible view, that made life miserable. If they got sick, then some evil spirit caused it. It dominated everything in their lives. Now, Paul then is showing how that this really doesn't exist in fact. But he cast out demons by the power of Jesus Christ. But the church had already been affected. The apostles in the city for three years, and still the church got used to him, I guess. And as a result, they went back to their old pagan practice and belief system and began to offer these incantations. Now, what has that got to do with Ephesians? We find that Paul corrected the matter. And we have every right to believe that he left Ephesus and the church there in good condition. But then some six to eight years later, according to the best chronology that we have right now, he, from a Roman prison, writes the Ephesian letter. And in the Ephesian letter, we find some statements in here that Acts 19 sheds some light on. Now, for an illustration, the Ephesia grammata, the naming of the names, is the very language the Apostle Paul uses in the prayer that he's praying for the Ephesian people. Look at your Bible in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul makes a prayer. And then in verse 18, I want you to look at verse 18. He makes the statement, I'm praying so that you will understand something. I want you to have the eyes of your heart enlightened that you might know the hope of the calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now listen and the exceeding greatness of his power towards usward who believe. He doesn't say he's going to give us any power. Don't make it say what it doesn't say. Say what the text says. It says he's going to exercise power in behalf of the church. Not going to give them power. Exercise power in their behalf. And then he begins to illustrate the power that Jesus has, and it's beyond description. He says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. There's the supreme sign of deity, the resurrection, a dead body coming back to life. Death has been conquered. Eternal life has been proven. This is the idea. But Paul isn't through yet. He says, and having raised him from the dead, he set him at his own right hand. Listen carefully to the words. In heavenly places far above us. Listen to that. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Paul uses the very language of the Aphasia Grammata, naming the names. And what does he state here? Inherent in this information 
He is telling the Ephesians, don't call on the names of these so-called gods and goddesses inasmuch as they cannot deliver you from the evil forces that dominate and control and affect your lives. There is one of the purposes for which he said what he said. You get that background information, and you'll be able to see why he said what he said about the Christology of Christ. Listen to that. He's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Who's greater than they are? Christ, enthroned at the right hand of God, quoted the 110th Psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Who's got the power? The one at God's right hand. What's he going to do with it? Save souls. And so after the Apostle Paul describes the indescribable power of Jesus, he says, and God made him, the one with all that power, to be head over what? All things. It doesn't say he's the head of the church. Read it again. It doesn't say he's the head of the church. It says he's the head of all things to the church. Your NIV says head of all things for the church. What's he the head of? Everything there is. And so a missionary comes to a church. And he wants to go into a mission. And they'd like to send him, but their budget isn't where it ought to be. Well, what they need to do is take it to the biggest banker of all. Because he is over all things, including the First National Bank. He can give them what they need if our faith is in that great, powerful Jesus Christ. Now turn back to Ephesians 4. Here in Ephesians 4, he says, beginning in, in verse... See, in this, in this fourth chapter, you have a number of things that contribute to the unity of the Spirit. In verses 1 through 3, you have the Spirit of unity. In verses 4 through 6, you have the facts, the absolutes of unity. And then you come down here to verses 7 through 11, you've got the agents, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers... And they are the agents that teach the Word of God and bring about that unity. And then, from verses 13 on down through 16, you have the attainment of the unity that's based upon the faith, which is my assignment. And here we're going to see the one faith. So look back up here then again at the statement of the facts of unity. Verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord one faith. One faith. Now what we want to do here is to look at that faith. This faith is, this is not your faith. This is the faith. When you find the definite article the preceding a noun, you have a specific. And he says there is one faith. And I want to take you through a series of passages. I'm glad you've got your Bibles. And we're going to look at these together and see the singularity and the distinctiveness of the Christian faith. But learn this first. We're not talking here when he says there's one faith about your faith. When he talks about the faith, he's talking about the thing believed. He's not talking about the act of believing. And this is consistent in your Bible. Reading this then. I want to ask, is your faith identical or trying to become identical with the faith recorded in the New Testament? Is the faith that you have taking its rise from the faith revealed in the New Testament? And if it isn't, that's why we wouldn't have unity. And so the faith is very strong here. First of all, before we go into that series, let me draw your attention to chapter 4. Look at verse 3 giving diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How does the Spirit give that unity? Drop down here to verse 13, where after he says he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, to the work of ministering, the building up of the body of Christ, he tells you that he gave us all these gifts that we may attain to the unity of the faith. Now, is it the unity of the Spirit, or is it the unity of the faith? And the answer is yes. How does the Holy Spirit give us unity? Through the faith. He doesn't give it to you by feelings. He doesn't give it to you by any kind of a subjective feeling. The Spirit doesn't operate on subjective feelings and then allow you to, without the Holy Spirit, 
without in inspiration, interpret your feelings as though these are the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's Pentecostalism, but that isn't biblical. And so what we're seeing here is how do we attain to the unity of the faith, and then we keep it. The Spirit gives it to us through the content, through the message of the thing believed. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 1.21. <laughs> Here the, now learn this passage. Take it home with you. Seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God. It was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the thing preached to save them that believe. Now the old King James translates that, and it's an accurate translation through the foolishness of the preaching. And it sounds like Preaching is foolishness. As one fellow said, I think I finally figured out why God chose preaching, although it's foolishness, to save those that believe in it. Well, he missed the point. But the King James contributed to that because of the language. Actually, what it says is, is not the act of preaching, but it is the message proclaimed. And that's the way it's recorded in some of these translations. Seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God. It was God's good pleasure through the message proclaimed. That's the thing preached. What is this? This is the thing believed, the faith. Here you have the thing preached is the thing believed. That's the thing obeyed. That's the thing that if we are making diligence to find out what that is and then cooperate with its teaching, we'll have unity as a direct result, cause and effect. Now, how many people today completely reject the biblical definition and identity of that faith? Somebody comes around, knocks on your door, and says, what faith are you folks? Boy, that is the language of Ashdod. Tragic. That's what denominationalism has done to the thinking of so many people. They didn't ask you if you're a Muslim or if you're a Hindu or a Christian. What they said is, what denomination are you folks when they say, what faith are you? But the Bible says there is one faith. There's one thing to be believed. There's one thing to be preached. There's one thing to be obeyed. And that one thing will produce unity and nothing else can. With this in mind then, I want us to come over here to several passages and to see that the Bible shows us under various designations from different vantage points what the faith is. Look at Philippians 1, verse 27. Now, are you there? Get over there, Philippians 1, 27. He said, Stand fast with one spirit, with one soul, striving for what? For the faith of the gospel. Now, preach the gospel, you'll wind up preaching the faith. The gospel and the faith, same thing. The good news is from different vantage points. The gospel is the good news that the kingdom of God, the reign of heaven, is in the hand of the one at the right hand of God. He uses that to save souls. And so what is the good news? What's the gospel? It's justification by grace through faith and obedience of faith in Jesus who has the reign to save your soul. There's the good news. That's the gospel. But you preach the faith, you preach the gospel. Now, turn with me here to the book of Colossians. Look at chapter 1. Beginning in verse 5, he talks about the hope which is laid up for you in the heavens. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? What is this hope? It's the word of the truth of the gospel. He says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, bearing fruit and increasing as it doth in you also, since the day you heard it, the word of the truth of the gospel, since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God and truth. What's the difference between the hope laid up for you in the heavens, the word of the truth and the gospel, and God? They're not a bit of difference. It's the same thing. And so the Bible is telling us there are different vantage points. Here's that great hope that we have. There's one hope. What's that come from? One spirit. He only has one message, even as there is one hope. So we find here that there are various ways of looking at the subject of the faith. Let's look at, a, at another one. Turn over here to Acts 6 and verse 7. We'll come back to that one in a minute. But he says, the word of God increased, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem exceedingly. Listen to it. And a great number of the priests were obedient to what? The faith. 
Now what do they obey to become Christians? The faith. Turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 17, 18. He says, Thanks be to God, whereas you were bond slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching and being then made free from sin. Now what makes you free from sin? What is it? Is it obeying that pattern of teaching? Or is it that one? Which is, they're both the same. But let's look at another one. We find in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, he says, If, 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 look at the condition. If you abide in my word, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. Now, reading verses 33 through 35, you'll find out he's talking about freedom from sin. And no doubt about that. And so he says, the truth will make you free. Now, just knowing it won't make you free, but the truth will make you free when, 1 Peter 1, seeing you've purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. So here's a truth, a specific body of truth, and you obey that truth and you'll be saved. But a while ago, we found out that we obeyed a pattern of truth, a pattern of teaching, and that made us free. Or we obey the faith, and that made us free. The faith, the truth. The pattern of teaching, they're the same thing from different vantage points. The faith, that's the thing believed. The gospel, this is the good news of justification by grace through faith in Christ. Here's the truth, it's not a lie. Look at the nuances of difference that really make a difference here. And so we turn over here to passages like Acts, the, uh, uh, come into a, other passages here, just a minute. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. It talks about Christ will be revealed from heaven and bring a great deal of destruction and bring destruction upon those who obey not the gospel. Then you read in 1 Peter 4 and in verse 17, what should be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Folks, you must obey the gospel, but we're to obey the truth but we're to obey the faith, Acts 6 and verse 8. Now, what shall we obey? The truth? The gospel? Oh, yeah. They're the same thing. And that's what we must learn about. And teach the brethren this so they'll understand these different approaches to the Word of God. Now, I want you to get your Bibles out. Turn back to Acts 6 and verse 7. I want to take you into, uh, through a series of passages to show you how the Holy Spirit places so much emphasis upon the faith. All right? Now let's look at this. Acts 6, 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem exceedingly, and a great company of the priests were what? Obedient to the faith. Now they heard the word, but they obeyed the faith. Now this is the one faith of Ephesians 4. Then we come over here to Acts 14. Move that Bible. Get over there to Acts 14. Look at verse 22. Paul is talking to the churches of Galatia. And he says, I want you to, con I want you to continue in the faith. You can't continue in the faith unless you know what it is. Somebody comes around and knocks at your door. What faith are you? What kind of language is that? That's not Christian language. It is double talk. It makes no sense biblically. And so we're finding here there is a faith that we're to continue in. Which one? This denomination, that belief system, that faith over there? There's only one faith, the faith. And the only faith that God is pleased with by which He'll save you. 1 Corinthians 1.21 is the thing that was preached, recorded. And when you read it, you'll, get a, you, you'll find out what the faith is if you stay with that. Keep reading here. Come over here now to Acts 16. Look at verse 5. Letters were delivered to those who, were in tra who, who had been affected by legalism. And the letters written by the apostles were sent to the churches, and it says they were strengthened in the faith and grew in number daily. Now what's back of evangelism? A knowledge of and an absorption of the faith so we have a number of passages here talking to us about the faith. Look at Galatians 1 verse 23, where it states that Paul preacheth the faith of which he once made havoc. Now you can preach the faith, believe the faith, obey the faith, continue in the faith. You begin to get the idea there's something you can identify. Now, let's turn to the book of 
1 Timothy. Just turn to 1 Timothy. I want you to see how, what emphasis Paul places upon the faith. In verse 19 of chapter 1, he uses faith and the faith. Look at that. He's going to talk about faith and the faith. Now you just read verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having thrust from them, have made shipwreck concerning the faith. Now does your faith identify with the faith revealed in the New Testament? What have you brought to the plate? What have you brought to school with you? What concept have you brought? What belief system are you abiding by? Does it identify with the one that's in the New Testament, which you have obligation to study out before you preach? Your lives are in jeopardy twice. First, if you're not a Christian. And second, greater judgment will come upon those who are teachers in the body of Christ. So we need to learn this. Now, in... 1 Timothy, look at chapter 3, verse 9. He talks about the qualifications of deacons and says they have to hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, the mystery of the faith, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 and Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery was, in part, that the Gentiles could share with the Jews in the great promises God made. So here is a Jewish deacon or a Gentile deacon, and if he's a Gentile, he can't, hurt, he can't hate Jews, and if he's a Jewish deacon, he can't hate Gentiles. And so the idea of holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience completely obliterates any kind of prejudice. A prejudicial deacon does not match up with the faith. Now look at verse 13. This man, if he does what he ought to do, will gain great boldness in the faith. Now drop down to chapter 4, look at verse 1. The Spirit speaks expressly that in later times, not latter, later times some shall depart from the faith. Can you identify those who depart from the faith? Well, you can identify the faith, you can. And then he says in verse 6 to the preacher, If you put the brethren in mind of these things, identify the these things used some 11 times in the book of 1 Timothy. He says, if you put the brethren in mind of these things, you'll be a good minister of Christ, nourished up in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine which you followed until now. The good doctrine, the faith. Put the brethren in mind of these things. Look down here at chapter 5 and in verse 8. He says, Christians have to take care of their families. He has to support his wife and his children, his mother and his father if that's necessary. And he states, and if a man doesn't do that, he denies the faith and is worse than an infidel. You can deny the faith. Look at chapter 6 and verse 10. You can be led astray from the faith. Chapter 6, verse 12. You can fight the good fight of the faith. And how does Paul end this magnificent letter to Timothy, who, by the way, is at Ephesus? I should have brought something out. I mean, just thought about it. Let me do it. Back up here to the fourth chapter. Where he says, the Spirit speaks expressly that in later times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Isn't that what we read over there about Ephesus in chapter 19 of the book of Acts? And here's Timothy over here in this haven of magicians preaching the faith. And so Paul emphasizes that nine times in this short letter. And here's how he ends it. Verse 20 and 21. Oh, Timothy. Oh, preacher, he says, guard that which is committed unto thee, turning away from the profane babblings and the oppositions of the knowledge which is falsely so called. Listen to this. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now you can hear the faith. You can preach the faith. You can believe the faith. You can obey the faith to become a Christian. You can continue in the faith. But Jude 3 makes a marvelous statement. We'll get to that in just a second. Now, do you begin to see there's an emphasis in the Bible on the faith? And that you've got to know it? And Paul connects that directly in the book of Ephesians to the unity of the brotherhood. And folks, since Acts 15, we haven't had much unity in the body of Christ. And so it has to do something with our knowledge of and our willingness to cooperate with the teachings of the faith. I want you to turn with me 
to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. You go home and read verses 7 through 11. You'll find that Jesus has gifts to give to the church. He gave them. And in verse 11, he identifies those gifts. Now, read the passage. He says, and he gave some to be. Now that to be is in italics. Because that's not in the original. Two obligations are upon the translation. Now on the translator. Number one, he is to take the best word or phrase that represents the Greek as he translates it into the vernacular. But there's a second obligation. He's to take the word or the best phrase that best represents the theology of the text. Some of our people who can't read a word of Greek can read their Bible and learn the theology of the text quicker than some of these scholars in the original language who have already been corrupted by their denominational belief. What I want you to see is that to be needs to be gotten rid of. Look at the, look at the context. Get the theology of the text. And what does he say? He gave gifts to the church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. He didn't give anybody to be anything in that text. He's not talking about giving them inspiration. They were inspired. Who? Apostles and prophets, not evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But these are the gifts God gave to the church. We've got them right here. We have evangelists. We've got three of them shouting on Sunday morning. We've got elders down here. One of the best we've had since I've been here. What we've got is teachers in the body of Christ. These are the gifts God gave to the church. If you're an evangelist in a church, you're God's gift to the church of Christ. If, if, if you know the faith and you preach it. Are you with me? Do you see this? Read the text. He says he gave gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Get rid of that pastors and see what he says. Shepherds. Every place in your Bible, with the exception of this one place, it translates poimain with the word shepherd. This is the only place in your Bible where the word pastor is in the English text. So what do we find? He gave the gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. What for? Read on. For the perfecting of the saints from teleos, the maturing of the body of Christ. Are your lessons designed to give people what they need to grow on? To mature with, for the maturity of the body, under the work of ministering, under the building up of the body of Christ, till, read it, verse 13, till we all attain to the unity of the faith. Why did he give apostles and prophets? They're on thrones of authority right now. You read about them in the book called the New Testament. They are there, they're reigning on thrones of authority, Matthew 19, 28. Their word is authoritative. Now we have evangelists, shepherds, teachers, uninspired, but God's gift to the church to preach the faith so that you can keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, we have a lot of immature people in the body. Welcome to the club. Till we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a full grown, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine after the slight of men in craftiness, after the wiles of error. But these apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, speaking the truth in love causes these babies to grow up in the faith. So do you begin to see that the faith that's revealed is the divine standard against which all belief systems must be measured, including ours. <laughs> In conclusion, the church has received an assignment regarding the faith. Turn your Bibles to Jude 3. Jude 3. He says, as I was giving all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation. Look at that common salvation. Well, there's unity involved in that one, isn't there? Common salvation. I was constrained. Was that inspiration? I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. I read about the word contend, that this is the very word that was used when the gladiators went into the arena. They would pair off, and boy, they would start fighting for everything like their lives depended upon it, because it did. Because after they paired off, only one of them would leave the arena alive. 
contending for the faith. How important is it for you to know the faith and be able to articulate the faith and be able to recognize the difference between the faith and any other faith that's not the faith? Your life depends upon it. The life of the church depends upon it. Contend earnestly for the faith. Our eternal destiny depends on it, as does our present unity.